You know, as I begin this uh, session uh, of my talk, uh, I just want to convey to all of you that my sincere and deepest uh, thoughts are with the people who suffered in the Boston bomb blast yesterday. It's been an absolutely dastardly act, and uh, and I hope that whoever are the perpetrators and whoever is responsible for such an act sort of get caught and get uh, full justice as as soon as possible. So it's been a bad news, and, and I hope things will be all right as, as, as quickly as, uh, as it's possible. First of all, um, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be at uh, this university. I've heard so much about it, and uh, thanks to your dean, Mr. Anand, and my good young good friend, Mr. Sunil Vitas, who have been asking me to come here for, I think, several years. <coughs> I finally managed to come. And it is always a pleasure to talk to um, youngsters and have a you know, conversation with them, because you're all so full of ideas. And uh, some of us who are on the other side of the curve that I was talking about in my session with, the, with some of you, uh, I think also have to learn much more. So I'm looking forward to the conversation uh, subsequent to my lecture then, you know, merely a monologue lecture from you. I'm going to talk about uh, <coughs> India growth story. Because we often hear, India is definitely a country which is growing. Uh, but we often hear lots of things that India has stalled and India has slowed down and the economist says, uh, India will definitely grow, but the question is whether it wants to grow or not. So, uh, lots of questions on India. And I'm going to deal with that subject over, uh, over, over the last sort of few hundred years, and definitely in the last 50 years, and more definitely in the last 10, 15 years or so. And, uh, and you know, what's the kind of journey India has undertaken? Uh, what are the characteristics of that journey? Where are we in that journey in terms of economic growth and bringing prosperity to our people in India? So that's what I'm going to talk about. <clears throat> and as we talk about uh, journeys of nations, a uh, journey of a nation, we must remember that there is no perfect system in the world. There is no perfect political system or there is no perfect economic model uh, with which you can say that this is perfect and therefore the success is guaranteed. Every country needs to adapt, uh, uh, you know, models that suits its culture and tradition over a period of time. For example, uh, for most part of last century, <coughs> there was furious debate, uh, you know, between, uh, uh, you know, free market capitalism and uh, and, and socialism. Uh, for a long time, uh, for most part of the last century, there was a debate in the world, and uh, finally, I think that debate ended with the fall of the Soviet Union in 1989. And the last century was actually a triumph for free market capitalism. Till, of course, the year 2008 arrived. And, and when uh, what we experienced post-2008 in terms of a global financial crisis has definitely raised some questions on uh, what is the kind of capitalism that we must have. Is, is it a good thing to have a completely unregulated free market capitalism? And where do we stop? And what is the, uh, what is the uh, shall we say, balance, the right balance between democracy and a free market capitalism? Where is the right balance? One may even argue, and I think this, uh, when you see uh, the success in China, uh, and, uh, and China has achieved great success in the last few years, last 20, 30 years, you would even question after some years as to what is the form of government uh, which is ultimately good for the people of the country. I know that that, that debate is not yet on. Uh, we believe in democracy. Both India and uh, United States have embraced democracy. I personally believe democracy is the right thing to do. But one may even question or one may even debate, and it is a, it's, it's a matter of a good debate among you know, even in the academic circles, as to in your journey, uh, where do you want to be a little more centralized uh, with centralized powers to do certain things for the country and where do you want uh, democracy to come in what is the phase in which it happened some of these discussions are definitely going to take place because it's not that only democratic countries have succeeded in the world there are countries like china which has adopted a little different form and i always see that china is actually approaching more and more democracy as years pass by and i'm seeing that 
and because China of today is not the China of what it was some 20, 30 years ago. So we need to keep that in mind uh, when we are describing the journey of a nation from a political perspective and from an economic uh, growth perspective that different countries uh, will adopt different models of this growth and each country and in India we have adopted a certain, uh, we are a democracy, we have adopted a certain uh, path and I am going to talk about it a little bit later but we must keep in mind that every country there is nothing perfect and uh, it is not often uh, ideal, it is not often correct to judge India from an eye uh, or from a, from a system which has had different system and different uh, set of problems and so on because India's problems are different. Let me get back to India. <clears throat> Many years ago, and I am going to start probably at five, six hundred years ago because the Indians have a habit of you know, talking in centuries and thousands <laughs> of years <laughs> rather than immediate. And I do know that uh, anybody, uh, anybody's mind uh, needs to be occupied more by the future and the, uh, by the present and the future than with the past, but I am, so I am going to deal with the past in a very short period of time. Some 500 years ago, uh, India and China, as many of you would know, India and China contributed 60 percent of the world's GDP. And out of that 60 percent, two third came from China and about a third came from India, which means India contributed some 20 percent of the world's GDP in the years 1500, 1600 and so on. And, uh, and we had a really uh, sort of rousing civilization with trade uh, with many countries, uh, especially the neighboring countries, Southeast Asia and Asia, and including uh, uh, with Europe. And uh, uh, being from the steel industry, I can also say that some of the earliest steel making and iron making efforts were actually in Sweden and in India. In the southern part of India, we have had even today, uh, you know, some remnants of what used to be you know, the method of making steel and iron in the 16th and 17th century. So, India was responsible for many uh, new things including the, you know, the, the introduction of zero to the humanity and many other things that India did and which is why it contributed 20 percent of the GDP of the world. India's problems have been in the last five, six hundred years <coughs> with successive invasions uh, from variety of people including the Mughals who came to India and occupied India for 300 years or ruled India for 300 years. Then we had the British rule for nearly 150 years. So over a period of some seven or eight generations of Indians, we have had a situation where we have been sort of subordinated to an external rule, which did not give rise to a great deal of innovation, great deal of competitiveness, great deal of freedom of thinking. None of that sort of existed. And even after independence, in, India got independence in 1947. <clears throat> and between 1947 and 1991, we chose on our own volition, our government's volition, we chose a socialistic pattern of society where everything was government control, uh, major investment were by the government, major companies were in the government sector, private sector was not allowed to flourish. There are very few things that was let into the country and very few things went out of the country. So we are sort of blocked from the world for 44 years and at the end of that 44 years because of this socialistic pattern of society and because of being non-competitive and uh, we found ourselves bankrupt <clears throat> by 1990 and the, as we were borrowing from funds from overseas, the World Bank and the IMF told us that look you can't borrow anymore unless you uh, sort of liberalize your economy and the economy was liberalized almost forcibly by external forces in the year 1991. <clears throat> I still remember uh, Prime Minister Mr. Narasimha Rao that time, who was one of the lesser known Prime Ministers of India and who is really the author of her <laughs> reform process in 1991. He was asked by a, by a US journalist at that time, listen Mr. Prime Minister, you have done a remarkable job. You have taken courage in your hand and you have liberalized your economy almost overnight. Where did you get this courage from? What is, what is your vision for the country? And Prime Minister Rao replied saying that, look, decisions are very simple uh, when you have no other alternative. And I had no other alternative and that's why I took that decision. So that is how the decision of, uh, of, of liberalization of this country took place. 
And from 1991 till today, <coughs> we have implemented several reforms over a period of time. In fact, many of us uh, who have lived our most part of our lives uh, prior to 1991 will in India will remember, we used to wait for two or three years to buy a car. Most of us actually bought only second-hand cars. We never bought a new car because the new car was simply not available. And if you are to wait for a new car, it will probably take you three or four or five years. And uh, <clears throat> if you wanted a telephone connection, uh, it will probably take you a year or two. If you wanted to make a telephone call to somebody in living in another city of India, uh, you probably have to wait for two, three hours for that, whatever it was called, the fixed time call or something which to sort of mature and actually come through. And uh, you would have to adjust your day schedule or an evening schedule depending upon how long the telephone call will take to mature. That's how life was. <clears throat> but in the last 21 years, 22 years, I think India has done well. And I'm going to read a scorecard for you about what, they are, what India has achieved in the last 21 years. We have not achieved everything, but everything is not bad. And uh, things are in the right direction. And I want to just give you a scorecard as to how the last 21 years looked like. In the last 22 years, the GDP of the, the gross domestic product of India grew <coughs> five times. And uh, in the previous 20 years, it grew two times, the liberalization. The per capita income of Indians on an average grew by 400 percent in the last 20 years compared to something like 40 percent in the previous 20 years. The household savings increased some 12 times. The foreign direct investment increased by 250 times in 20 years. The foreign exchange reserves grew by 30 times. Of course, while these numbers are impressive, we also must know that the base was low in 1991 as a starting point. The exports increased by 15 times. In 1991, <clears throat> for a population of about a million people, I think we had uh, 500,000 phone, phones, 500,000 phones, 0 0.5 million phones. Today, for a population of 1.3 billion, we have a total subscribers of something close to a billion subscribers. It's over 900,000, and we don't know uh, exact count. And every month, India had some 15 to 18 million subscribers. So this is the major change that has happened in the last 20 years. <clears throat> also, if you want to buy a car pre-1991, you had just two models. And both the models were uh, British models. And they were probably 1994 and 1945 or something like that. And you had a choice of those two models, which are both you know, 50, years, uh, 50 years outdated. Today, we have every car that is available in the world is available in India. And lots of cars and lots of vehicles are manufactured in India. You had wide variety of choices. The cars are queuing up for people to buy, which we have not been used to for many years in our lives. <clears throat> you don't have to wait for telephone connections. You don't have to wait for gas connections. Your phones are absolutely online. So there is no issue today on those, is on those basic necessities of life. But have we done everything? Have we done what we could have done? We could have done, of course, definitely more. We still have issues. For example, the last post-liberalization between 1991 and, let's say, the year 2000, India's GDP grew at about between 5 to 6 percent. Prior to that, for 44 years, the average was about 3.5 percent. We improved it to 5 to 6 percent in the first 10 years of liberalization. And between 2000 and 2008, we grew almost at 9 percent. There are years in which we have exceeded 9 percent, and the average was about 8 point something. And even during uh, the global recession of 2008-2009, India grew at 6.4 percent. <clears throat> but in the last two years, we have slipped. In the wake of continued globalization, our exports have sort of reduced because of the fact that the global economy is not doing well. And we have had some issues from the, on the political front, from the coalition government, and so on and so forth. We have had a few scams uh, throwing up there. And there is an issue of governance in some pockets of the country. With all that, the, what was uh, 6.4 in the worst year for the world in terms of economic growth, where we grew at 6.4 percent, where the world overall grew at none. I mean, it was a flat curve on the, in that year. 
The next year that 6.4 went to 8.6, but then in 2011-12 it fell down to 6.9 percent and in 2012-13, the, the year that has just ended, we grew at only 5 percent. So there are some worries on the, on the growth front and therefore in the last, I would say, a year or uh, last six months to eight months, including the budget that our finance minister announced, <coughs> we had three important priorities as we go forward. One priority is uh, fiscal consolidation. It's important to have fiscal consolidation. It's difficult to have because we must remember that in spite of all the growth that India has achieved, the growth is not yet inclusive. It's important that the growth is inclusive and the, and the benefits of growth needs to, economic benefits of growth need to reach all cross sections of the society. In fact, if you have to ask me uh, as to which one I, which of the alternatives I choo I'll choose, would you choose a high growth path of 10 to 12 percent with uh, income, uh, with, with, with benefits uh, going disproportionately to people? Or would you accept a growth rate of, a lower growth rate of maybe 7 or 8 percent with benefits going to a much larger cross section of the people? I would prefer the later. Because we must understand that India is a, is a country with 1.2, 1.3 billion people population. And every year we have something like 10 to 12 million people, 10 to 12 million youngsters coming into the job scene. And therefore it is necessary to ensure, uh, in order to ensure that there is social uh, peace and there is no social unrest, we, meet, we need to make sure that the youngsters are gainfully employed. So inclusive growth a, a, for India is far more important than growth per se. So uh, the efforts of the government and the efforts of the business in India is on threefold. One, that we need to have a fiscal discipline for the country in spite of the fact that we have subsidies in India. We have a large poor population which needs to be supported for some years before they are enabled to be uh, sort of earning their own, you know, and create their own wealth. So we have fertilizer subsidies, we have food subsidies. It's easy for many people and especially the, uh, the financial analysts to say, you know, that's not a good way of doing it and you must stop uh, subsidies. Uh, subsidies are bad uh, for, you know, behavior, to, to, to have a proper behavior uh, in terms of chasing real creation of wealth and so on. But you can't do that when you have a 1.2 billion of population, which is why India has chosen inclusive growth as a more important agenda than growth per se. And, and it is important, which is where I believe and I think, and maybe we can have that conversation during the course of our question and answer session, which is where I believe that India and China are adopting a slightly different path of growth, where we are a democracy. So by nature, and, and I think all of you experience democracy in this country also. So by the nat very nature of democracy, uh, the decision-making process is a little so, but it is a very inclusive process. Once a decision is taken, it will get implemented. And, and more importantly, we want to make sure that, uh, unlike China, which is growing at a much faster rate and creating uh, wealth at a faster rate than India, we want to make sure that the rate of growth is consistent with inclusive growth and not a growth which is non-inclusive and therefore will give rise to problems at a later, uh, later stage. So the priorities of India, the priorities for the government of India and for the business of India are threefold. One is that we want to contain the fiscal deficit in spite of the subsidies and so on. And our budget in the recent budget has made plans for that to contain the uh, fiscal deficit uh, from about 5.2% to 4.8 or so next year and then going down further. And similarly, revenues the deficit, which is at about 3.9%, we are planning to take it down to 3.3% and down. And secondly, one is of course making sure that the fiscal, the fragility of the fiscal system is rectified. The second is reviving growth. And the recent budget announced by the finance minister has a number of measures for uh, reviving growth in the infrastructure sector and the manufacturing sector particularly. As we all know, um, any, there is no large country in the world, including the United States, including the Western Europe, including Japan, South Korea, and many of these countries, including China today. There is no large country in the world which has become economically prosperous without going through a solid phase of manufacturing for at least 10, 20, 30 years. Because manufacturing gives employment all around, and manufacturing employs people 
uh, at, uh, at variety of categories uh, because every country cannot have highly skilled people you know overnight you will have a graduated scale of uh, you know upskilling of the population over a period of time so manufacturing fits into that uh, category of uh, where you can employ a large number of people you can employ different kinds of people you can employ people in the rural villages manufacturing doesn't have to take place in Washington or in Mumbai or in Delhi, it needs to take place elsewhere in the country. So you go to the places where population exists rather than asking population to go from villages to urban population. So and we realize that India's contribution of manufacturing to manufacturing to the GDP of India is only 15 or 16 percent, whereas in China it's about 35 percent. In Germany, even though it is a higher cost economy, and people may say once you have higher costs in the in the country's cost structure, the manufacturing uh, go, goes out and becomes less. That's not true of Japan. That's not true of uh, Germany, because what they have done is they have gone into higher end of manufacturing rather than stay in the same end of manufacturing as as they were doing earlier. India's contribution manufacturing contributes India 16% uh, of the GDP in India, which we want to take it to 25% of the GDP by the year 2022 and for that a number of measures have been announced similarly on infrastructure a number of measures have been announced so the second subject the first one is containing the fiscal deficit the second one is uh, is reviving growth and the third one is to have that growth inclusive and there are a number of measures uh, announced in the budget as well as in the policy statements to make sure uh, that inclusive growth is, uh, is, is something which is given priority. And I want to talk about inclusive growth and I mentioned that unlike many developed countries, inclusivity of growth is very fundamental to India. And often it is not realized because when we talk about economic growth, we forget about what quality of economic growth it is or what kind of economic growth it is and where is that growth happening? Is it happening in urban areas or rural areas or in villages and so on? And for India, it is important. It is not so important for, for example, for many developed economies, it's not important for, it is also not important for less populous economies, but it is very important for a large country with a large population and with a large population spread out in the, in the villages. And uh, <coughs> both the government of India as well as uh, business houses and I personally believe that uh, we can't ask the government to do everything. The business has a responsibility to ensure inclusive growth. So the business under the leadership of the Confederation of Indian Industry and the other industry association, we have actually taken on the responsibility of ensuring that each of our companies uh, and Tata companies do it extremely well and we have been doing it for, for over 100 years where we train people uh, to make sure that people are upskilled. We give scholarship to people. This is especially for what is called the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes of India <coughs> through a program called the Affirmative Action uh, Program. And we always tell the government saying that look, because the government has a, the Indian government has an inclination or, or a desire to make the Affirmative Action as a compulsory program for the companies. Uh, on the basis of certain reservations and quotas and so on, which some of you from India may understand. But as far as the industry is concerned, we are saying that, look, we want, we are aware of the problem and forcing an issue of this nature onto companies is not a good way, good method of sort of uh, succeeding in that venture. And therefore, what we would like to prefer to do is to actually take an affirmative action and a positive action to ensure that we upskill people, we train people, we uh, employ more of the scheduled cars and scheduled tribes, we give more of opportunities. Because what we are talking about, what I am talking about is not uh, equality of outcomes, because the uh, outcomes will never be equal. Outcomes is going to depend upon a person's uh, <clears throat> ability and his intelligence and his hard work and so on and so forth. I am talking about equality of opportunities, irrespective of where you are born or what you know, kind of parents you were born into, what kind of family you were born into, what kind of town you were born, which school you went, or whether you could go to school or not school, you need to have equal opportunities compared to any, anybody else in the population. And that's what we are aiming at. So India's aim, in my view, India has achieved quite a great deal between 1991 and 2001. And in fact, I often say that India is a country which is about 20 years old or 20 years, 22 years old. We may have had a 5,000 year history 
and and that to my mind not rel relevant. Uh, what is the reason I is not relevant is because a large part of that was an uncompetitive era. A large part of that was 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 not an era where you had, where the country or the companies or the governments or the nation had to compete with somebody else, and it was not an open country. It was a blocked country from both inputs and outputs. So I call India as a country which is 22 years old since economic liberalization. And in the 22 years, I think we have achieved substantially. We have chosen a growth path. And that growth path is of having an inclusive growth, even if the growth is not stupendous, like 15 16%. And we have had great success for bulk of that last 21 years, except for the last two or three years. But lots of things are in shape. And, and I believe that there are three or four issues which are fundamental to India, which is going forward, on which actions are being taken. One is the governance issue, uh, the issue of uh, corruption. <clears throat> and, and I dealt with it in the small group session that I had with, with some of you. And uh, I, I, it's being talked about more also because of the fact that, that now there is a social media. We didn't have that social power of the social media in India, say, till about five, six years ago. So it's a good thing that it is being talked about. <clears throat> there are more people going into jail than before in terms of you know, very senior people in the government and the public life and so on. And it's being talked about more. There are more headlines on that subject. I think these are visible signs that the problems are being recognized and the problems are being uh, sort of uh, attacked or, uh, or getting tackled. So one is the governance issue. And the second issue is the issue of, uh, of, of inclusive growth. How can you uh, bring in greater and greater population of the deprived communities into the main fold of economic growth? It's uh, extremely important. It is perhaps more important. You know, India has got lots of opportunities, as all of you know. It's a young population. It is an educated population. It's got tremendous amount of energy to and passion to perform. So all that is all positives. But if you didn't do uh, take everybody into the fold of, uh, of growth, you will find uh, unequal growth taking place, and that itself will cause uh, social unrest. And of all the impediments that we have in India, personally, I believe the, uh, the, the addressing the social inequality, because India requires not only economic growth, India requires social growth. And if the, social, if the economic growth is not accompanied by social growth, uh, and, and many of the uh, uh, developed nations don't see India from this perspective, uh, from a perspective of improving the social quality of life of the people of India, and that is fundamentally important. And many of our companies and the government are are, are focusing on that subject. I will stop at that, and uh, and uh, all that I want to tell you is uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor, and thank you, Sunil, for giving me this opportunity to speak. I look forward to, in fact, more of interactions from you than merely my talking on the subject. Thank you. I'm Nick Hilpo, a senior undergraduate student. Um, based on your impressive educational background, um, your engineering from IIT, and your master's in business administration from XLRI, you talk about some of the soft and hard skills you developed in these educational years that kind of enabled you to have so much success at Tata Steel? You know, I, I was talking about it in the group, so what I'm going to say is probably be a repeat of what I mentioned in the group a little while ago. <clears throat> and on the same subject, we were having a conversation with the dean uh, in his office a few minutes ago. You know, when we go to school and when we go to colleges, and when you go to educational institutions, management schools, we learn a lot of knowledge inputs. You know, we learn chemistry and mathematics and physics and marketing and finance and so on and so forth. So all these are knowledge inputs, which the teacher gives to the, to the students. But in order to succeed in life, in order to tackle the problems that you will uh, face in life, uh, in order to make sure that you run your industrial organizations well or institutions well or when you run your country well, you need a lot more other qualities than merely knowledge. In fact, if you are to ask me, I would put uh, a weightage of 30% on knowledge and 70% on lots of other things. 
and those lots of other things are the softer skills like uh, you know a passion to perform uh, energy levels of a person uh, you know uh, how does he or she handle failures how does she handle disappointments how does a person handle success and many of these qualities are not in the conventional teaching mode and so what we are doing is 70% of what is required in a person to face the challenges of life we are leaving it to chance for that person to experience and learn and 30% of what he needs for success which nowadays as the dean rightly mentioned to me the student can get from elsewhere and you got various tools of getting it by in the, with the press of a button which we didn't have in our time so we are focusing on that 30% and not that 70% and i personally believe <clears throat> that over time the education systems changes are required in this arena what you need to teach more is more of that 70% and what you need to teach less is 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 less of that is of that 30% and many of these qualities come from uh, you know lots of other other activities it comes from sports it comes from music it comes from sociology it comes from philosophy it comes from action reflection cycle uh, it comes from conversations it comes from good observations it comes from thinking about what you have done uh, and how to correct yourself uh, and and i think the education system needs to adapt it i don't have a solution to it i am not a, a, a academic scholar or anything but i think we need to have a debate on how do we modify the system to give the students the right proportion of that 70% and the right proportion of that 30% that's my view okay, one <coughs> question uh after my question you can open it up to the audience um i'm a senior my name is kishore alakrishnan uh got in pursuing finance degree uh my question is about um a lot of businesses these days are going towards consumer supported trends such as corporate social responsibility, sustainability and environmental stewardship. What are some of the successes and challenges which Tata Steel has had over the last decade um in addressing these issues and what what are some of the <coughs> progress that the firm has made? You know Tata Steel doesn't talk in terms of a decade I mentioned to you it talks of <laughs> No, <coughs> no joking. You know <laughs> Uh, Tata Steel was started more than 100 years ago. Tata Group started 150 years ago. When Tata Steel started, uh, when the Tata Group started 150 years ago, it started with the philosophy that the fundamental purpose of a business organization is to improve the quality of life of people around. In order to do that fundamental purpose well, you need to run your industrial enterprises well and profitably. to make sure that part of the profits go back to the society so the corporate social responsibility of tata group and tata steel is something which is enshrined in the philosophy of tata steel it is not that you make profit and then spend part of that profit on society no after all in making profits in running your enterprises you pay salaries to your employees you don't pay salaries to employees from your profit if you didn't make profit still you pay salaries to your employees maybe it is a little bit less or more whatever it is so it is you buy raw materials for your operations you buy services for your operations so just like you pay your employees and you pay uh, you know you you pay for your services or you pay for your raw materials and inputs and so on you pay for your machinery you need to discharge your corporate social responsibility as part of that business and the net results is profit you know quite often people have asked me saying that why are you spending so much money uh, you know it's going away from the bottom line <clears throat> i say no it's not going away from the bottom line it's actually adding to the bottom line and i often say them it's very difficult for me to explain to you you need to come back to our place and see what we are doing for example tata steel in the area of its operations we have adopted 650 villages wherever people go and work they go and work to help people in irrigation in farming in water management in maybe medical care in health services uh, basic education uh, you know fertilizers you know self help to sort of uh, help people to you know generate their own create their own wealth and uh, we have our teams who physically go there 
and actually work in the villages. And it is part and parcel of a company. And in fact, we have a very strong belief that uh, the corporate social responsibility of an organization is not an independent subject. For, a, for example, our boards will not accept an annual business plan unless it, it just like you have got markets, you, you go, you're going to produce something, you're going to sell something, you've got a price at which you're going to sell, you've got a cost at which you're going to incur for making that product. Our boards will not accept an annual business plan unless the corporate social responsibility is part of that business plan. So it's actually fundamental to the Tata Group. And I, in, in fact, the Indian government <coughs> is uh, thinking of uh, introducing a new thing, new uh, uh, provision in the new company law bill where it's going to mandate or it's going to ask or it is likely to ask the companies to spend at least 2% of the net profit on the corporate social responsibility. Organization like CIA and people like me are not in favor of that. The reason is because you need to do that as a part of running your business, not as a result of your making profits. These are two different mindsets. So Tata Group is very, very much in favor of, uh, you know, a companies being part of the society. And I believe that companies are meant to serve the society and not merely meant to serve the shareholders who are put in money. <clears throat> yeah. You mentioned so many positives about corporate India today compared with 1991 and 1966 when you began. Inclusive growth is a goal and objective along with corporate growth. What hurdles exist in the following idea? The two largest democracies, albeit with different measuring matrix, with the two governments, how can the two governments cooperate better to improve the business and trade climate between the two? You know, governments don't cooperate. <laughs> Businesses cooperate, but governments don't cooperate. You know, look, as I mentioned, every country has a different model. Uh, <clears throat> the United States chose democracy and free market capitalism as the route to prosperity. India has chosen democracy. India has chosen inclusive growth for certain reasons, because of the population and the nature of the population, so on. China has chosen as a little bit different route. It has chosen a route of uh, becoming healthy first, becoming strong first, becoming robust and wealthy first before adopting the principle of democracy, if I, if I read China well. Uh, and I think that's what is happening in China. So the jury is still out as to which is the perfect system. And nobody can say that this is better or something else is better. As I said, till 1989, uh, as long as the Soviet Union was alive, Everybody said socialism is important and there was a big voice in favor of socialism also. But in eight, 1989, it died. And then we had 2008, when I think uh, there was a comment made in, uh, by Beer Stearns, I think at that point of time in 2008, that uh, the, the free market capitalism died today or some, some such thing. Uh, you know. so I, of course, it didn't die on that day, but the fact of the matter is it's being questioned as to what should be the nature of that free, free market capitalism. So every country needs to adopt its own, uh, its own model uh, of growth. And I don't think anybody can say anything is perfect. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your remarks. Uh, I want to ask you a question about governance. You know, Tata Sons has always been an icon uh, for Indian industry, and one of the areas in which it's widely recognized as being, you know, best amongst the best is in corporate governance and basic transparency, right? And I heard Ratan Tata interviewed a couple of days back by Farid Zakaria, where he spoke about the Tata Code of Conduct that I'm also familiar with. So my question to you is, in this very large organization, with lots and lots of people, all of whose behavior you can't control. How do you, as the leader, you know, ensure that this idea of transparency and governance and ethics is diffused throughout? And what do, what do the different companies do? Now, first of all, by having a proper code of conduct and making people understand that code of conduct, 
making people sign the code of conduct. We all signed the code of conduct, including our unionized employees and so on. And frequently talking about it and taking actions wherever you find uh, something which is different from what ought to happen. These, these are the actions. You know, uh, a lot of it, a lot of these actions come from leadership, good leadership and good communication and walking the talk, demonstrating. There are many examples in the Tato group where we have not succumbed to what other people may have succumbed. And we have lost out in the short period of time, in a, for, a, for a short duration of time. But I don't think we have lost out over, on a longer distance frame, on a longer time frame. We, we are uh, uh, the largest, fastest growing group in, in, in India. Uh, we are one of the most profitable groups in India. And we have had this, uh, all this done with proper ethics and governance processes. So there's everything going for what we have done. <coughs> Rob. My, my friend, Mr. Mutsanarayaman, yeah. nice to see you. Uh, another question about Tata Steel. Uh, many multinational service centers for the steel industry that process steel have come to India and teamed up with Indian manufacturers. Uh, it's a rush of companies coming and teaming up with producers. Where do you see the service center industry evolving? No, India needs a lot of service centers. The only th I know it, this is a very specific question pertaining to the steel industry and many in the audience uh, may not immediately catch the relevance of it in the in the bigger concept, but still I will address that. You see, uh, India needs a lot more service centers than what we have today. But India's model of going forward with the service centers is going to be different from the United States model. I feel that, uh, I mean, this is my perception, that in the United States, the customer of the steel industry has been given a way to the service centers and the steel industry has not bothered enough about customers. You know, you have had as the steel companies, you have had the service centers, then you have had the customers. And the steel industry has forgotten about customers. And the ownership of customers has been taken over by the service centers. With the result that the steel companies' visibility to what customer requirements have not been very good. Which I, I, I think the steel industry in the United States has lost out there. In India, what we want to do and what we are doing and what almost every company is doing is we want to create a service center by ourselves or by somebody else, making sure that the customer is owned by us and customer is not owned by the service center because the manufacturer must own the customer, especially in a, in a, in a B2B business. Uh, the manufacturer must own the customers. That's important and that's the way we are going about it. Hi, my name is Yash Mehta. I'm a freshman here at the Smith School. Um, my question relates to more of the personal side of your life. Um, so growing up in a country that was still struggling to find its identity, struggling to you know, develop, um, how has that shaped how you lead your team um, and how you make decisions in your company today? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> You know, India's, you know, we Indians who have grown up in India, and let me also tell you something, and I was uh, mentioning it to my friend Kapil Sharma only, I think, last evening, or maybe today. When I graduated from IIT Madras in 1966, I had, I had an offer, I had a scholarship offer from the University of College of Los Angeles for the material science department. And the scholarship was uh, not too bad. It was four hundred dollars a month, uh, which in nineteen sixty-six was, I think, a fair amount of money. I also got an offer from Tata Steel at a salary of four hundred rupees a month, <laughs> which, which, in today's uh, terms, it's about what eight dollars or something per month. But I chose that. I chose Tata Steel because of the advice that I got from my professor. I went to my professor and asked. In fact, it was my professor. Uh, of our metallurgy department who sort of got me the uh, University, UCLA 
uh, sort of scholarship because he was associated with the Kular. He was a professor over there. But he is the person who advised me that, look, don't go to Ukla or go, don't go to the, uh, you know, don't go abroad just now. Well, this country needs people like you. So at that point in time, some of us were a little bit more, shall we say, nationalist than, than <laughs> the youngsters of today. And that's the reason I joined the company. But today, we know that, after all, you know, life goes on. And India should make itself marketable to make sure that people come to India to work. There is, there is no question about it. Nobody can force anybody to go to a, a particular place to live or work. It's going to be his or her choice. And we are very conscious of that. So I don't ask people. For example, let me tell you, my own uh, two sons live in the United States. I have not been able to have force them or make them come to India and work. But we know as corporates and as leaders of Indian industry and Indian public life, we know that we need to make India a marketable uh, entity. And that, I think, is more and more happening today. Because India has got a lot more opportunities. There are, uh, there are of course, issues in India, still infrastructure issues, basic necessity issues, uh, clearances and government approvals. All that is a bit of a nuisance just now. But I also think that there is a, there is a, there is a great uh, excitement and the great uh, feeling of uh, being able to contribute to even a few steps that a country can take in terms of its progress. Then merely joining this country in, at a stage in which that country is fully developed and where we don't have too much of contribution to make. I mean, that's my view. Many of you youngsters may not agree with that. <laughs> A question about uh, the globalization of Tata Steel. Uh, you know, we know from data that uh, the majority of acquisitions don't succeed. Uh, the percentage that succeed, that cross-border is even less. But the Tata Group has had phenomenal uh, success. Tata Steel itself, of course, you know, you bought Chorus. So looking back at the Chorus acquisition, uh, what would you say were the, were the things that you did right uh, in the integration of Chorus? Uh, and if you would uh, uh, think of any things you might have done differently. You know, let me deal with this question of acquisition in a general term first before I come to uh, Chorus. The way the Tata group looks at acquisition, uh, and I in fact addressed this question in the small group that we had with the students, and so one of the students asked me that question. The way Tata group approaches an acquisition, first of all, we don't like to use the word acquisition. And we use that word only because of the fact that I don't know of any other better word to describe that event or the process. And that is the only reason I'm using the word acquisition. We don't want to be uh, seen as an acquisitor because an acquisitor has a certain mindset of coming and marching over the vanquished, you know, uh, asking for the corner room and the biggest table, uh, changing people and say, I'm sending a shipload of people from India from tomorrow, and they will be the bosses. We don't want, in our acquisition philosophy, we never do a hostile takeover or hostile acquisition. If a company wants us, then we would buy. If a company does not want us, we will not buy. And I think Mr. Tata dealt with it uh, in, in a couple of days back in his interview also. We will not do a hostile acquisition. In fact, Chorus came to us. We did not go to Chorus. Jaguar Land Rover did not come to us. We were having a conversation, but we were actually having a conversation on something else in that company. And then the whole of the Jaguar Land Rover came to us. And in that process, there was another suit of a Jaguar Land Rover. And the unions of Jaguar Land Rover actually said and expressed an opinion that they want Tata's to come and take over. Similarly, the executives and the unions of, the, of Chorus actually wanted Tata's to take over, even though it, it went to a, through an auction process and the results were sort of indeterminable. So the approach we take for any takeover is that are we able to go and create value? Are we acceptable? Is there a cultural fit into that? Is there a philosophical fit between what we think, believe is the way companies ought to be run and the way companies are run? We don't go and change people. In fact, the Jaguar Land Rover, the leadership team is the same as before. In Chorus, the leadership team is the same as before. We have not sent people from India. It's not that just because you are an acquirer, 
you got some superior, uh, you know, mental capacities and mental capabilities. And I think people who run those companies are equally good, or maybe some of them are even better. In fact, once we acquire a company, we actually start looking at who is the best, and the best guy will get the job, or the superior job. It's not that just because you are an acquirer, you have got more, you know, higher skilled people or higher capacity, you know, capable people. It's not so. So the way we have approached acquisition, I think, is different from the way that most companies in the world have approached. I believe that we are on the right path on that acquisition, because we think we don't have a business to go and acquire a company that does not want to be acquired by us. By us. We want to work as partners rather than as a owners of the company. And these are some of the ways. And exactly the same thing has happened in Chorus. <coughs> Just to let everyone know, we have time for about two more questions. Can I have a question from uh, my Chinese friend? Yeah. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Um, uh, my question is on the strategy of the globalization of companies from China or India to the global market, especially United States, uh, especially from the perspective of Tata. Uh, what's your experience of the globalization of and the core cooperation with the corporate like like core corporations in the United States and, and the UK? Because uh, this weekend I had had a dinner with, with the bank, banker, which is the global's largest real estate pro property, and and the, their CEO and the other the other uh, CEOs from for for Fortune 100, and they are very interested to extend their business to United States. But it's in a very early stage. They just set a two-staff office in, in New York. And uh, as an MBA student who is uh, seeking a summer intern, I hope, hope, hope apply job to be hope to be third. But from the experience of, of Tata, I think you, it's, it's, it can be a mentor, and not, not just a pioneer, but also a mentor to the Chinese firms to learn about how to be globalized. First of all, I don't think we can consider ourselves as mentors uh, yet. So, so I don't want to be in that mentor position as yet. But look, I, I want to tell you the Tata experience in both United States and in Europe has been extremely positive. What we see is a far greater level of transparency, uh, very good governance. The laws are very clear. Upfront, you know what you uh, can do and what you can't do. So, uh, and it, it's, it's, a, it's a democracy, uh, both Western Europe and, and, and the United States. And uh, your voice can be heard. You can go and object to if you, if you didn't like something, and I know we can be heard. And even though there are some issues with which we may not agree, like for example, currently there is a visa issue going on with which I don't agree. Uh, because in the long term, uh, I don't think it's good for the United States. But we are having a conversation on this subject. Here, you can have a conversation on any subject. And you can have get clarity on any subject. And that is something which we like, which is true of both the United States and, and Europe. Whereas if you go to some of the countries, for example, Africa is a growing region. We are, we are present in Africa in many countries. We are present in some 14 or 15 countries of Africa. And there are, of course, there are 40 more countries in Africa which we, which we want to enter. But some of those countries are very difficult to operate. You need to, you need to, you need to be able to have very strong courage and conviction of your fundamental principles in order for you to be able to operate uh, properly in, the, in those environments. But compared to this, these developed markets like United States or Europe are extremely friendly from a point of view of proper business ethics uh, for us to conduct. That's uh, hi, uh, my name is Ashay Doshi, and I'm personally from Mumbai. Uh, my question uh, stems on the manufacturing point you raised. Um, if you see the recent news that Novartis was rejected a patent in India, and many other companies are getting wary about investing in research and development, something that India is sort of lacking behind what the United States is used to. And that goes hand in hand with improving manufacturing and going with inclusive growth. So what are your views on the research and development side and companies getting very to come into India to invest the resources? <clears throat> no, India, India definitely lacks in research and development. India 
has done a lot of work in research and development. In fact, recently uh, there is a paper by the government of India. The government of India had constituted a task force on research and development, which was uh, co-chaired uh, by the Secretary uh, Technology and Development and myself from the industry side. And we have submitted some new fresh proposals for incentivizing research and development in India. But it is a fact that we need technology especially in areas of high-end manufacturing, in areas of aerospace, in defense areas, many of these areas, uh, biotechnology, nanotechnology. And in fact, I, uh, I, I do see, see what's going to happen in the world. You'll find a country uh, very competitive at a certain point of time, and then it will move up in the cost curve because people will want to live better, they will expect a better life, they will expect a better environment, better quality of water, better quality of roads and so on. That is going to push up the cost of cost curve of that country and therefore it will become uncompetitive for certain products. It needs to shed those products, move into a higher end of manufacturing. If you didn't do that, the country is going to be no longer competitive. You need to be able to develop higher end technology to be able to offer to somebody else. Maybe go to those countries and jo become joint venture. That's a progress that a country would normally take or should take to, to retain its prosperity of, uh, of its people. If that doesn't happen, and sometimes I feel that in Europe perhaps that curve has not been well, and there is too much of uh, 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 spending uh, without having the ability to sort of uh, earn, earn this money that you have spent. Uh, whereas in the United States, I think that balance is very much better. And one of the reasons why we always believe in India that from the current uh, stagnation and current recession, one of the first countries to remain, to come out of that recession will be the United States because of its R&D and because of its technology and so on, its innovative power and so on. So if Indian companies and uh, US companies can collaborate there, it will be a wonderful thing. And that's where, to my mind, uh, I, and I often say this, India needs United States. It's the largest economy in the world. It's the largest market in the world. But India is going to be one of the two largest market in the world in the future. So the US needs India as much, I think, for the future as we need India, uh, as India needs US for the present. 